I mean, like, I'm very, sometimes I'm very heavy. I want you guys to think a lot. But feeling is something that's also part of us. And when we are inspired by God, we want to follow, but then fear does overwhelm us. And isn't that the Christian story? Whenever we are overwhelmed, God reaches out, He holds our hand, and He says, Oh, ye of little faith. And so lots of you guys are going through a lot, okay? Let's say it's just school, maybe it's stuff with your family, maybe it's just very personal. And one of the things we talked about Friday night was the fact that Christmas sometimes can be a very dark moment. Because when we understand where the prophecies of this Christ child comes from, it was in a very dark time of Israel's history, and the message is that it's going to cut through, the light of the world is going to cut through all that darkness, and he's going to save us from the darkness that is sin. And that's the message of Christmas. Next week we'll get right into our Christmas series, but we're also going to see how that relates to what's going on in Acts chapter um, 16. Okay. If we remember what we talked about, this whole idea, when it comes to Christmas, Christ, that child that was born, the first missionary example, he did not have to come. He did not have to give up his rights to be here restricted as a human being. You know, kind of wading through this world that is full of sin. To die for sins that he did not commit. To save with people who are ungrateful. And we see Timothy giving up his rights so he could reach out to the Jewish people. We will see also today Paul and Silas doing something extraordinary and thereby inspiring the question from the jailer, Where, what must I do to be saved? That's the question that we want to inspire to all those people who around us who are looking and seeking and yearning, who are lost, who know that they're in such a mess of a situation and they think that that's the way that life is. It doesn't have to be. And the message of Christmas is exactly that. God made it so that it did not have to be that way. Okay, so we're going to go to our story in Acts chapter 16. We ended with chapter 15, uh, sorry, verse 15, where Paul and um, Silas, they went to Philippi in Macedonia, and they went to Lydia's house. And therein began um, the beginnings, if you will, of the Philippian church. And those of you guys who had the time to read the letters to, a letter to Philippians this past week, you can see how much Paul was encouraged by these people there. The Bible fills out for us the lives of the men and women who pen those words inspired by the Holy Spirit. Now it's interesting because Paul and Silas are still in the region of Macedonia and Philippi, and they're going to the place of prayer where they're met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. So here's this girl. You know, sometimes you read the horoscopes and it's so general it can apply to literally anybody under the sun. Okay. But sometimes you get these moments where people are actually, they have this ability. And it is not from God, and it is from a darker force. And this girl was possessed by this demon. She was enslaved spiritually. And she had this uncanny ability to tell things about the future. And people, of course, are attracted to this. I kind of find it weird, because what, what good is it going to do you if you know certain things about the future? You're going to try to avoid it. It's going to happen anyway. But anyway... So she's got this ability, and people are so interested, and she makes a killing. She makes a lot of money for her owners. And so this is what I will call she is twice bound. She's bound once by a spirit that plagues her and that kind of traps her in this life that she leads. And she's also bound economically because her masters are using her for their economic gain. She is a slave twice over, and she is being used. And she follows Paul. And she follows the team and she cries out, These men are the servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And so she begins to call this out. And she kept doing this for many days as Paul is doing his ministry. And he becomes annoyed. And he turns and says to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. Okay. There's two things that I want you to gather from this first portion of our passage about this slave girl. Or this girl that was able to divine things about the future. Number one is the authority of Christ in people's lives. Paul does his missions not because he's so eloquent, because he's so well equipped, but because the Spirit is with him and he goes with the authority of Christ. There is boldness, there is confidence, there is surety in a life that is led by Christ. You know who God is. You know that if he asks you to step out into the waters where there is an unknown area of your life, that he is perfectly able to save you. Otherwise, he would not call. You, otherwise, you are not ready. But he will equip you to be ready once he calls your name. And as you guys are graduating slowly out of high school, okay, 
kind of did a little number on me. Um, our baptism confirmation candidates are mostly born in 1999. I remember that too clearly. Okay. You guys are getting older, and slowly God will call you out of your physical comfort zones, you know, your home, the family that you knew, your parents will get older, you will have to take care of them. There are things in life where you are slowly come to the borders where you're going to have to make your own decisions, and God is calling you to give that portion of your life to Him. And what a beautiful phrase that is, that the Spirit will lead you where your trust has no borders. You're not going to say, border and block God off and say, this is, this is all I'm going to do. And Paul, when he goes out on his missionary journeys, he has started to unbreak or un undo those borders, so to speak. And he experiences the power of Christ in him. And the authority to cast out this demon comes from Christ alone. It is purely by the power of God we're able to do the work of God. So back to the phrase that we've been saying over and over again. The Spirit of God given to the people of God to do the work of God. And it is God's business. It is his heart to see his people free. The reason why Jesus came to free us from our sin. And this is a theme of God's loving um, kindness. This is a theme of his passionate love for his people to free us from what binds us. And so Paul casts the demon out. And it's interesting, one of your link leaders asked me this question, why is Paul annoyed? So a little bit of a side note. It's kind of like this. When she first came along, it calls a lot of attention to the ministry that Paul is doing. Okay, These are the servants of the Most High God who's going to show you the way of salvation. People are paying attention. But soon, it becomes too much of a hindrance. He actually can't talk because she's doing all the actions in the background. So he turns around and he makes her be quiet and she is freed and now her masters are angry. Their golden goose, so to speak, has now been, um, has now been neutralized. I guess that's the best word I can think of right now. She no longer can divine. She has no longer this power to bring in this money for the masters. And they would rather have her be enslaved than have her freed. And this is the second thing I want you to notice about this passage. The evilness that our hearts are, potential, um, can poten are potentially capable of doing. Okay? These masters, for the sake of money, would rather see a human being bound by a demon. They would rather have to use and manipulate her bondage for their own willingness and therefore, again, put upon her two heavy chains that they have the ability to free her from. And they refuse to do it. And when she is set free, instead of saying, you know, the good thing would be, I'm glad she's free. The okay thing would be, eh, whatever, we'll go make some money somewhere else. And then they go a step further in the opposite direction and say, we are angry that she's actually liberated from this dark force. And they take Paul in silence to the Roman governors, or the leaders, okay? And they say that they advocate, this is verse 21, we skipped a few um, verses, they go to the magistrates and they say, they advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept their practice. When we get to the end of the story, we realize that Paul and Silas, both are Roman citizens, they don't show their hand, so to speak, until the whole narrative goes through. But they are Roman citizens. They have the right to speak up now. They don't have to be judged by these people, but they go through it anyway. And they are thrown in jail. But before they are thrown in jail, and this is where it gets very tough, the crowd joined in attacking them. And the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. It is a violent scene. Okay? You can imagine somebody walking down the hall, bullying a kid and tearing the backpack off his back and, I don't know, spilling it on the ground, whatever bullies do. And you can imagine that they're literally tearing the clothes off of these men. And they're, you know, as they stand there, they probably have their undergarments on, they are hitting them, they're beating them, they're flogging them with rocks. Okay? We kind of joke sometimes that, you know, we were hit when we were growing up, but this is different. It was a punishment that was meant to do two things. Number one, inflict a lot of pain. It is not easy to be flogged. Jesus Christ was flogged before he was crucified. Those of you guys who have seen the fashion can see how violent and how heinous that can be, how gruesome it is. Paul and Silas are flogged. Not only that, they are humiliated. They know in their heads that they are Roman citizens, but they never call upon that right until the very end, and it does two things. They are in pain, they are punished, but they are, they are also humiliated in front of the public. And you and I know sometimes, we probably do know what it feels like to be humiliated. Okay, sometimes you guys are very scared to come on up here and share your testimonies, but I make you do it anyways. Okay? 
Juan on Friday night had a very embarrassing moment, but you know, you push through it. You have these moments where you're humiliated and you're embarrassed, and it was meant for this purpose. And Paul and Silas afterwards, they are thrown into prison and they have these locks on their feet. So these wooden locks so they couldn't escape. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. Okay. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the prisoners were listening to them. Okay. One of the things that we recognize about this story is that as Paul and Silas are entered into prison, they don't feel sorry for themselves. They know that what they've done, they've released a girl from bondage, the other people reacted to this situation, so it's kind of like, well, we're in the situation we're in because we did good, and as far as we're concerned, we're going to praise God, we're going to sing hymns to them, and the other thing is that the prisoners are listening to them, and when the Bible points this out, it's not like, oh my goodness, they're making so much noise next door. They're listening to the prayers of Paul and Silas. They're listening to the hymns. And something about the way that these men are praising God, the prayers that they offer, are changing the hearts of the men inside them. And they're making an effect. They're changing the people around them simply by demonstrating their faith, their praise, their trust in God. And then suddenly there was a great earthquake. So that the foundations of the prison were shaken. This is not one of those, did it come, did it go? Everyone knew that this was an earthquake. And the foundations of the prison are shaken. We are told that immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bonds were unfastened. So, you're locked. I don't know how crazy an earthquake it had to be, but all the locks are opened. This is what I would think. In my humanity, I'm in jail. God sends an earthquake. Thank God. All, I'm alive after the earthquake, first of all. And then all the doors are open. If anything, I would think this is a God-given earthquake that he gave to me so I can escape prison and I don't have to go through a lot of harm. That would be the first thought that goes through my mind because this doesn't happen every day. It doesn't happen that coincidentally. We don't believe in coincidence. Not only that, the doors are all opened and we have this perfect opportunity to escape. But we're told that when the jailer woke up, he sees what's going on and he is so scared. And he, he's going to take his own life. He drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. Okay, that's a logical thing to do. Because if you were a jailer and all these guys are in prison and all they want to do is get out, there's an earthquake, all the doors are open, you're not going to assume that they're going to be in their cells. Okay? They're going to escape. That's what you would do. That's what I would do. That's what we would expect other people to do. If you're in prison, there's an opportunity to escape. You go. Okay? When you play Monopoly and you have those, you're in jail. And you get the opportunity to stay in jail. Nobody stays in jail. You want to get out. Make some money. Look the Monopoly high life, whatever it is. It's against human nature, in other words, to remain in prison in this situation. And maybe even... For those who are spiritual, it might even go against their spiritual nature because we think that God is the one that opened this door. So how does Paul know that this is an opportunity to save a soul? As the jailer draws his sword and he's about to kill himself, Paul cries out with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. Okay, so Paul and Silas decide to stay. Because as Roman citizens and anybody who actually lived under the Roman Empire would know that the punishment for losing a prisoner is that you take upon yourself that punishment. So let's say I'm, I'm walking with um, Sarah Ann and she's my, I'm her prisoner, let's put it that way. I'm her prisoner. And she, okay, actually that's, she's my prisoner and she runs away, okay? And the punishment that she was being, um, she, that she would have had to suffer was that she dies because she did something so awful, okay? I would suffer her fate because I let her get away. That was the understanding of Roman law. Now in this particular situation, because it was an earthquake, it's not like he lost the most. It's what they would call an act of God. He wouldn't have had to take his life. The Roman government wouldn't say, now you have to die for letting all these prisoners go. They would have let it slide, but there would be a little bit of shame in his family, according to his name, because he must have something, done something to upset the gods or something like that. So he was going to take his own life anyway, and Paul says, stop. We understand that Paul and Silas because of their heart, because of their whole mission in life. They, we understand why they wouldn't go. But we all, for every single prisoner to stay, we go back to the beginning when Paul and Silas were singing hymns and they were praying and they were praising God. Something about that moment convinced every other prisoner there that it is good that they do not run so this man does not have to kill himself. That is what we call an effective 
a contagious Christianity. Something about the fact that Paul and Silas were staying. And I can almost hear Paul saying to the other prisoners, listen, you guys are all guilty. You belong in prison. This man was just doing his job. Why should he take his life? And he somehow convinces them to stay. And because of the way that he shows that compassion, other people, it's easy just to say, well, no, that's your business. I'm going to get out of here. But every single one of them stays. And Paul is able to say, we are all here. The jailer, he doesn't really believe this. He calls for the lights and rushed in. And trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? We're going to pause there for a moment. Paul and Silas, okay, it's obvious that they trust God. And that's the thing that we want to talk about. At the, this second half of the story, that's the first thing that I want you to focus on. Their attitude, their faith, and trust. Okay, I'm feeling that Oceans is going to become a very popular song with you guys. I already have people, you know, wondering if it's going to be part of the March Break Retreat. Because there's something inspiring about that, um, that uh, bridge. To take us beyond where our trust has no borders. The attitude that you and I have as we live life in this world shows us that we are qualitatively different from everybody else. That our faith is not dependent upon the marks that you get or the reputation of your parents or how healthy you are, but rather upon somebody who is so greater than all this, that controls all this. So it doesn't matter where you put us. You can put us in jail. You can put us on a shipwreck boat. You can flog us. You can give us money. It doesn't matter. We have trust in a good... I'm sorry, we have trust in a good... And sovereign God. Okay, what follows afterwards okay, is an extraordinary account of compassion. Why should Paul and Silas stay? After they were flogged. Okay, the story goes on to tell us that oh, it was only after he asked how he could be saved where he began to wash the wounds of Paul and Silas. In other words, their wounds are open. They are bleeding and they're thrown into jail. Nobody cares for them. So why should they show that kind of compassion to the jailer? They don't know him. He's their, guard. he's their guardian. He probably wasn't very nice to them. But the moment that he's going to take their life, Paul says, don't. And this is what we call extraordinary. And this is what convinces an unbelieving world that God is worth following. That God loves the people around him. That God uses us to reach out. Because we're talking about this idea of things that we don't have to do, but we do anyway. Out of compassion. Out of courage. Out of the love of God for the sake of saving more souls. And so the question I want you to think about is what have you done? How do you live your life so that the people around you say, what must I do to be saved? Have you gone that extraordinary mile? This is the whole concept that Jesus was preaching on when he said, when if somebody asks you to go one mile, go two. When somebody slaps you on one cheek, turn the other. When somebody asks for you know, your cloak, give them everything you have. This is a concept that Jesus was talking about. Go out of your way. Because if you do what everyone else does, okay, they gave me, they did a favor for me, so I'll do a favor for them. That's what everyone would do in this world. But not everyone would stay in prison and save the life of a guard that jailed them. That is extraordinary. That gets people to pay attention. That gets people to ask, what must I do to be saved? The happiness that you have, despite the pressures of the world, how you encounter certain things that the world throws at you, how you treat other people who bully you, who look down upon you, that makes people ask, why is this person so different? Okay. The student who is polite to the teacher that is mean to everybody else, that makes the teacher ask, why is this child so nice to me? The brother or sister who reaches out to their other sibling when they had a big fight. The, the, the son or daughter who reaches out to their parents. That makes people stop and ask, what should I do at this point? It's such, a, it's such a weird way to react to a situation where we know that how humans would react. But it is godly. It is Christ-like. It is unexpected. It is God's love. The child that was born in the manger. That is not the way that we would expect God to come. But it calls attention to the people who are paying attention. And the wise men from the east come and they worship this child because they know that there's something very special. They come to worship. And I want you guys to live a life where the friends that are closest to you can start seeing a deep change. And they start asking, what is so different about my friend that I've hung out with for three years in high school? 
Why are they so confident about grade 12? Why are they so happy about the future? Why are they so compassionate to me? I wasn't really nice to them last year. I totally ignored them, in fact. Why is it that they continue to love me? And that's the power that we have when we have lives on this earth, the ability to reach out to the people around us. In extraordinary circumstances, when a certain action is expected, but love is rather given. And so the jailer, he asked Paul and Silas, Sirs, what must, I do be, do be, to do, what must I do to be saved? And he falls at their feet, and they say, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. So basically the jailer takes him home. And he took them to the same he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once, and he and all his family. It's, there's something very poetic here. As, Paul, as the jailer takes Paul and Silas, you can see their backs that are bleeding, or wherever they were hit, they're bleeding. And he washes their wounds, and Paul in turn washes him with water. It's the significance of baptism as he is accepted into the body of Christ and washed clean of his sins. And this is a relationship that you and I are called to have with the world. Not tit for tat. Not eye for an eye, that was the law before Christ came. But compassion, love, that knows no bounds, that challenges us, sacrifice, suffering, so that we can win those over who are around us. Timothy displayed that. Whenever you guys choose to love rather than share a word of anger, or get back at someone, or once you learn driving, cut in front of that person because they cut in front of you, that's what makes a difference in a world that can be very very um, difficult to find connection with. And that's what everyone's seeking. The Bible tells us that God made us in His image. And until that image, that fractured image, is put back together, as we find ourselves in Christ, people are always going to be searching. And there's a lot of weird answers out there. Okay. That's why the girl, when, people, when she was able to divine about the future, people were attracted to that. They are attracted to spirituality, but not every spirituality fulfills. It is only Christ. And that's the message that you have to share. That's the message you have to share not only at Christmas time, but every single day of your lives. The story goes on, and let me end with the rest of the story and a couple quotations that I want to leave with you um, as you go into the rest of the week. And so they go, and the household believes. He brought them to his house and set food before them, and he rejoiced along with his entire household um, that he had believed in God. But when it was day, the magistrate sent the police, saying, Let those men go. And the jailer reported these words to Paul, saying, The magistrates have um, sent to let you go. Therefore, come out now and go in peace. But Paul said to them, They have beaten us publicly uncondemned men who are Roman citizens and have thrown us into prison, do they now think that they can throw us out secretly? No. So here Paul puts a little bit of political pressure. You realize I'm a Roman citizen. You come and you escort us out of this um, town. And so they come. They realize that they've made a big mistake. And so there's a timing to all this. Paul could have said, I'm a Roman citizen at the very beginning and he would have even gone to jail. And he would have met the jailer and the jailer would have been saved. But again, he's giving up his material rights. And he makes it known later, and he uses it to get out of the city, and uses it to kind of protect the church, because now they know that people of the church are protected by Roman citizens, so they're going to get a little bit more leeway there. And he returns to Lydia, and they share their story, and they go on their way. But you see how Paul always thinks of God's mission first. It's not my money, my school, my life, my comfort, my convenience first. It's always, what can I do to expand God's kingdom? And if I need to sacrifice A, B, C, then I will do so, because I will win the soul of Mr. X. I will do what it takes. I will sacrifice whatever it takes. I will endure flogging. I will endure humiliation. I will endure a night in jail. I will endure the temptation to flee, and I will speak to this one person so that him and his household can be saved. And that was the way that the apostles did the missions in the early church. And that was why they turned the world upside down. It was what we call faith. Anything less than that is not. So we're going to go to a few quotations on your link page by David Platt. Let me read a few of these for you and share some of my ideas. Every saved person... This side of heaven owes the gospel to every lost person this side of hell. 
What meaning it, it simply means that if you are saved and you know the gospel message, you owe the gospel to those who are not because you did not come to this knowledge of salvation on your own. Nobody does. Nobody comes to a knowledge of salvation on their own. Somebody tells them they've heard something or the Holy Spirit opens up their heart. Nobody makes their way to this knowledge. And if somebody gave this to you, it is not yours to keep and you owe it to give to somebody else. And on that note, we begin to understand Paul's heart. He received this from Christ Jesus, and he's got this inside of him. He realizes how much of a sinner he is. And that's why he writes, I'm the chief of all sinners. How can the apostle Paul be the chief of all sinners? But he understands the depths from which Christ had saved him. And so he has this burning passion, this urgency to share the gospel with whomever will hear. And he will give up whatever it takes to do so. David Platt's second quotation on your link sheet. I could not help but think that somewhere along the way we have missed what was radical about our faith and replaced it with what is comfortable. Faith, Christian faith, Jesus Christ following faith by the very nature of who Christ is, is radical. Because Christ first loved us. Because Christ came down, gave up his rights for us. Anything less, I'm not sure if it's faith at all. The faith that Christ asked for when he asked the disciples to follow him, when he asked Peter to jump out of the boat, when he asked Peter, that, and he told him that later he would go on and die for him, when he told Ananias that Paul would suffer on his behalf, all that is radical faith. When Lydia listened to this person named Paul about the Messiah, and she said, I'm going to open up my home so a church can start here, that is radical faith. When Mary said, yes, I will you give me, God, my body, so this child can be born. And I can suffer humiliation because people will talk about how I'm pregnant before I'm married. That's okay. I will give that up. That is radical faith. When the men from the east came to worship this child who was not even part of their religion or culture, that is radical faith. Do you understand the life that God is calling you to? It is exciting and it is contagious. Once you start living your life, and that kind of faith, trust without borders, you will attract people to you because that is the life-giving message that all of our souls are, need, are attuned to. When they hear that message, it, it clicks and the Holy Spirit works and thereby people are saved. We're going to end with this final quotation by David Platt. It's a bit long, so you can follow along in some link sheets. We will not wish we had more money acquired more stuff, lived more comfortably, taken more vacations, watched more television, pursued greater retirement, or been more successful in the eyes of the world. And he's talking about when we're dead. Instead, we will wish we had given more of ourselves to the living for the day when every nation, tribe, people, and language will bow down around the throne and sing the praises of the Savior who delights in radical obedience and the God who deserves eternal worship. You think that when you die, you want to have tried more stuff, had more money, eaten more food, watched more movies, spent more time on the computer. But even at the end of your semester, when you see your marks, you realize that you should have done something else. And you don't regret spending that much time on the computer. You regret not studying. And even in that simple, worldly example, you see that there is something more worth than the distractions of this world. When you die, there's a funeral tonight, in our church, one of our elders, he was 86, he was hit by a car the past week. Side note, please be very careful during the holidays and any day actually. And he lived this life that gave so much back to the community. He immigrated to Canada in the 1960s. Okay? My uncle immigrated in the 70s. So everyone, the old school Korean people who immigrated back then, they all know him. He was the first president of the Hanin which means the Korean is Korean uh, association of all the people who were Korean in Toronto back then. And he, he's known to have opened up his home to other visa students when they came, to teach them English, to help them with immigration papers. His wife used to tamo kimchi, because you know all Koreans love kimchi and they miss home back then. So she would make them and give them to the students. This is a family, this is a couple who understood what it meant to give, that it was more important for them to serve the Korean community, the youth students that came, and to be part of a church body than to gather more for themselves, because he was very well educated in both Korea and the University of Toronto. He could have made a lot of money. He could have lived for himself. He could have established a very good reputation. But those of, those of us who know him personally, 
We understand the sacrifices he made. When you die, okay, whether it's 10 years from now, whether you're 80, whether you're 90, maybe 120, you will not regret what he listed here. You will not regret not having more money or more stuff. You will regret not giving more of yourself to the people around you. You will regret not saving more souls. And Paul understood this deeply. So him and Silas, again, an extraordinary story. They are in jail. Perfect opportunity for a jailbreak, but they turn back and they see this man who's going to take his own life. He doesn't know God. If he takes his life, he's not going to get into heaven. And so they stop and they say, don't take your life. How many of you are willing to stop and look at one person in your life who is so lonely right now, who just needs somebody to say, let's go to church, or let me share with you why I have joy? How many of you are willing to just stop for a moment and have that one conversation? Because that, again, is what an unbelieving world will find very convincing. True compassion, sincerity, a humility, and a radical call to faith. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.